There are headphones that are just easy to drive, easy to use, and a pleasure to make use of. Then there are those headphones that are so complicated that makes you despise the hobby. Why do you have to be so difficult? Welcome to the Fostex 909 review. We need to talk. So, this huge box arrives all the way from Japan, except this one didn't. This one came from Mimic Cables. Thank you so much for sending this unit in for review, mate. I really do appreciate it. Mimic Cables is a dealer in Fostex, Audacy, Focal, and Benchmark and a myriad of other companies' equipments. So if you are interested, feel free to check out the information down below. If any of those headphones, amplifiers, DACs, etc., is to your liking, and send him your love. So, Fostex builds this unit in Japan, a Japanese headphone, and this box is rather heavy, but very, very light. And as we open the outer layer of the box, we have two other boxes inside. Let's open this sideways like this so that it doesn't block our view and set this one aside. And then there's another compartment of the cardboard shell where we yank out this accessory, put that on top of there, and we yank out the cables. Very vacuum cleaner-esque, but we'll get onto that in a minute. Now, let's get rid of this box. Yoink, shut, close. Go away. It feels like a cereal box, legitimately. Frosties or something. Not sponsored. Be nice if we were sponsored by Frosties though. So, uh, let's actually explore the cable first. So, it's a cloth covered cable with the first hurdle, which is a two pin connection, very much akin to the Sennheiser line of headphones, but do not plug your Sennheiser cables into this headphone because they're connected backwards compared to the Sennheisers and you're gonna get phasing issues and a lot of proper problems, you probably destroy the drivers. This one terminates in a very, very nicely built 6.3 single-ended connection, but you can upgrade the cable from Fostex themselves or third parties, but be aware, this little adapters, so if you are getting third-party cables, will cost you roughly $70 to $100. I think it's around $70. So those will have to be exclusively bought in to create your custom cable. And the next thing we have here is, yoink, take that out of there, is this, yeah, protein leather. It's not real leather. Um, carrying case for your 909s with the etching right at the bottom here. That's really nice. Uh, feels a bit rubbery, but yeah, very fluffy inside. Very nice. My Sesvaros came with, same, with something similar, and um, it is something you will never use, to be honest with you. So let's throw that over there off camera. Actually, that might mess up with the lighting. Go, yeah, we don't need those anymore. That cable, ergonomic wise, is not very great. It's heavy, it's thick, and you might want to invest in something else. But this is what you're here for. Nice outer layer box, probably upside down as usual. Documentation and a nice inlaid foam to protect the headphones as they sit in here. Now, there's nothing else in here apart from some Japanese salt. Do not eat that. Let's set that aside for now and move this other box out of the way. Taking a tour around the headphones, Japan's lacquer Bordeaux finish has been applied to the cups. They attenuate a little bit, forward and back, rather well, and, and up and down, very nicely. The actual adjustment mechanism is wonderful. They're very light, they're only 390 grams, and it's just beauty all around. The build quality of this headphone is absolutely ridiculous. We are talking true flagship build quality, very light, very ergonomic, and look at that cup, Jesus Christ. These headphones are a semi-open design with a double layer metal mesh that has been overlaid each other so that the holes broaden as it goes towards the back of the cup and they narrow and shrink as they come forward. This is supposed to help with distribution of sound as it's escaping the drivers because these are a semi-open back. They're not completely open, but 
fit and finish, my goodness, there is a video I will actually link down below where you see the construction of these headphones and how they do the coloring. It's magic. Love goes into this, the way the Verite and the way the Meze Audio headphones are focused on. It's just beautiful. Very, very light, very comfortable, very open feeling. And as we discussed, the connections underneath are that odd proprietary two pin connection akin to Sennheiser, but wired backwards. So please don't use your Sennheiser cables with this headphone. Fit and finish, phenomenal, outstanding. Some people might find issues with this thin headband, uh, especially with that channel in between the padding. I haven't found a single bit of problem with it personally. The specifications for this headphone, we're looking at 25 ohms. So it's a very easy to drive headphone with 100 dB sensitivity. That already is uh, throwing up red flags for me. Easy to drive headphones are notoriously difficult to drive correctly. And this is no exception. It's been a freaking nightmare, but we will get onto that. The driver behind the Fostex 909 is a 50 millimeter dynamic driver using 1.5 Tesla magnets with propulsion technology. The biocellular drivers is using some custom proprietary technology behind this as well. So interesting drivers, but they're dynamic. They're 50 mil, they're not very large and they're extremely easy to drive. I mean, you can take this on the go with you. I wouldn't recommend it. They do leak some sound. So they're not your train and your bus headphones, but around the office and around the house, you can actually get use out of it if you can drive it properly. These wedge design pads are rather interesting and very, very comfortable. They're protein leather as well. I think they use the inner layer of eggshells to actually construct this pad, or that might've been the 900s, but I'm pretty sure it's the same similar um, method of making these pads as the 900s Mark IIs. Those are rather legendary as well. I can't wait to bring those in for review. So that's the headphones themselves. Pretty, beautiful, gorgeous, well-designed. So where is the problem? Because these headphones are notorious. We have some reviewers that absolutely despise it. We have some reviewers that swear by it and nobody's in the middle. We have fans of these Fostec headphones and we have people that hate them. Untangling the untanglable is what we do here and I have spent the last four weeks putting these through its paces. It's been on my desk as my daily driver with the Elites and the other myriad of headphones that have come in. And we've got to the bottom of it. What the problem is and which equipment you personally should actually use with these if these are your sort of headphones. This is not for everybody, first of all. Second of all, not all of you will reach for these but the ones who do know exactly the reason why they are buying it. This is a $2,399 headphone, which is basically in the upper flagship territory of Verite Closed, approaching Diana's, Stellia's, Verite Open, Empyrean, and a myriad of other headphones. So this is up against some serious stiff competition and it's doing something that none of those headphones do because it's very different. The performance you get out of this is very different and specific. It's not a everyday headphone. Comfort is, sound isn't. This is one of those flagship headphones you have in your lineup that you reach for. And once you reach for it, you realize why you love them and why they're there. But then after the listening session's over, it will go back on your wall, back on your shelf, and it will come out again at a later date. It won't be constantly at your desk. Very few people I think would use this as their daily drivers. There will be some of you who do, and please put it in the comment section below if it is your daily driver and why setting aside the comfort, because I can imagine you actually using this as your daily driver due to that insanity comfort. So that covers the housekeeping, hardware and technical abilities. Let's talk about the overall sound before we break down the frequency response. Mm -hmm. 
The overall sound characteristic of these headphones is V-shaped. Elevated bass, extremely elevated treble. Recessed mids, but with ultra high resolution. Like the drivers are clean. So clean, it's like looking through one of those glass windows in a shop where you don't know if it's there when the sun shines through it and you have actually seen people smash into it because it's so transparent. It's detail galore in the treble region. It resolves ultra well, too well, some people might say, and it's as finicky as hell. You will not just throw this on any amplifier and get the best performance out of it. In the span of three songs, you could go from, oh my God, I love these headphones, they're God, to, oh my God, I hate these headphones, what the hell have I done? Easy to drive headphones are notoriously annoying to drive well. Easy to drive headphones that are already finicky due to these Tesla drivers, which are trigger happy, like the Bayer Dynamics T1 V2, is another situation we have here as well. I've ran these on a variety of equipment which we will dive into in the equipment section, but the overall sound is open stage, airy as hell, extremely good imaging, highly resolving treble region, like insanely resolving treble region. If you love treble, if you love detail of Electroacoustic guitars, acoustic guitars, plucky instruments, and simple music with three or four instruments. Once you drive these well, they are absolutely phenomenal. If you like pop songs, if you like metal songs and rock songs, and things that are not mastered well, you are going to have a very, very bad time of it. But if you love Hans Zimmer, if you love bands such as Catatonia from Sweden, or you love bands such as Animals as Leaders, general acoustic music and film scores, and you've set up your chain, I think these are the headphones for you. Because the way it resolves and the way it presents detail to you in a transparent manner is beautiful. These headphones, I never got the feeling I was listening to the music. I always got the feeling I was watching. It always impressed me what it was doing. Very rarely did the songs ever take me away the way a verite would. But it was more of an analytical listen to see what the music was doing. And I think that gives you a nice overview of what the headphones actually sound like. So let's break down the frequency response. Now, this section is a little bit tricky. I have not pad rolled these. I have reviewed it as is, the way you probably would when you take it out of the box. And it sounds different on the equipment that was being used. So I will, first of all, use the equipment that best synergizes with this headphone so that I can give you a detailed analysis of how it's going to perform before we delve into the bad pairings that we've had here. And the good pairing we have here has been the Chord Hugo TT2 and the M Scaler, a almost $10,000 setup. With those in mind, this is what you get. The bass region, depending on the genre of music you're using, taking something like pop, for example, feels a little bloated a little overly emphasized and a little bloomy without it impeaching into the mid-range territory but it feels overly large not in a good way but if you're listening to film scores to something like Hans Zimmer the sub bass articulates phenomenally well this is not a pop or a rock headphone this is real instruments this is there to show you what real instruments are doing. So the sub bass actually is neither really elevated for those kinds of genres, nor really in the background. It's got good body, it's got good texture. 
and it's got good definition. Surprisingly good spatial presentation within the stage itself as well. It can go from, oh my freaking God, what is this headphone doing? It's incredible to, oh Jesus Christ, did I pay for this headphone? It's so difficult to judge, but it's got the resolving capability to give you good texture, fantastic body, excellent separation, and good nuance with the other instruments that are in the sub bass category. Climbing up to the mid bass, this is where I have a lot of issue with this headphone because of my general listening. I like pop songs in the morning. I don't analyze headphones when I wake up and I have my coffee. I like pop songs. I listen to Eastern European music mostly and for every pop song, pretty much, sometimes it feels a bit bloomy and it feels a little bit over bloated. But when I move away from that genre of music and I throw electroacoustic music on here and I throw well mastered, beautiful songs on here, taking Hans Zimmer's Pirates of the Caribbean, one of the hardest tracks to resolve correctly, I threw it at this headphone. It accentuated instruments in this mid bass category with good definition, not overly hyped attack, but good attack and good punch and good visceral nuances. So that when a bassist is plucking the strings on a double bass and we are climbing up the scale, leaving the territory of the sub bass to the mid bass territory, notes are swollen, clearly defined in a clear glass room, if you can envision that. And each note floats in the air and it's easily identifiable. You can almost feel you can follow the musician's fingers up and down the fretboard of the bass. Climbing up to the upper bass region of the frequency response, it's actually well defined with good resonances and good body so that nothing come across thin because I stated this headphone has overly emphasized treble region like in probably one of the most treble forced headphones I have ever come across. That includes the T1 from Bayer Dynamics. Um, but yet, the higher end spectrum of TomToms still have body during the attacks, which is wonderful. It's fantastic. Climbing into the mid-range, we have a very, very, very dark mid-range characteristic on these headphones. That goes across all equipment used. This is a V-shaped headphone. Yet, it loses none of its nuances. It's got all of its characteristics. It just takes a massive step back. And it's a dark sound signature. There is a dip in the lower mid-range, in the mid-mid-range, there is a peak in the upper mid-range, and there is a dip just between the mid-mids and the upper mids. If you can envision the mid-range as a string of beads with 30 beads in line, like this, some of them are low, some of them are high, there are peaks at times where the bead is much higher than the ones below it, the mid-range is very dark. So, mid-centric instruments are not lost, but they take a massive step back. They're not the focus of the show. The focus of the show is in the bass range, and the focus of the show is in the crazy imaging. It's really good. Climbing up to the upper mid-range, it's very, very forward. The upper spectrum of the mid-range is very forward. Lower spectrum of the treble region is extremely forward. So is the mid treble and the upper treble. So it's doing this bass, curves inwards with the mid-range and then comes right forward again in a U shape for the treble region. So it provides this kind of shape. Bass forward, mid-range back, treble region forward. But when the pairing is correct, you have some of the most resolving, detail galore, transparent, non-convoluted treble region in the price point of the $2,000 to $2,900 category. It's insane. Like I stated, electroacoustic guitars, acoustic guitars, single instruments, saxophones, 
Bands that only comprise of three or four instruments like jazz, the definition is crazy. The detail is crazy. Like I stated, the listening experience on this is very singular. And you bring these headphones out at times, not every day, but it's a wild ride. So the frequency response plays thusly. Now let's talk about some of the bands and songs that were used to push this headphone to its limits. I went right through Hans Zimmer's collection, his pride and joy being the live concert for the Pirates of the Caribbean two-parter suite on Kowas. One of the most difficult tracks, eight out of headphones literally crap their pants. When testing headphones with that track, even using some of the most expensive and best gear money can buy for headphones. I mean, we have like the ore stack from Furum with a DAC3 from Benchmark. We have the TT2 and the M Scaler. We've been using some very, very, very high end equipment with these headphones. But when I put that track on here, and like I stated, it breaks eight out of 10 headphones. I was very surprised. It resolved the treble region extraordinarily well. Nothing became discordant. It could not identify each individual instrument. Everything was a little soft, but the spatial presentation and the reproduction of each instrument in that 30, 40 piece band was non-convoluted. It was easily identifiable, especially when you hit the crescendo, when a multitude of instruments simultaneously hit a specific note together, where it would utterly destroy something like an LCD XC. This headphone managed to resolve it very, very well. The mid-range was a bit lost and the band was much further back than it ought to be at times, but it's an orchestra. They are supposed to be set back. So you could see a massive floor space between you and the people on stage. Very resolving in the treble region where you could actually hear the conductor walking around and wiggling his, uh, whatever the hell he wiggles. Insert word here. So for me, this is the treble region headphone for whenever I want that kind of listen. It articulates well, the driver is very resolving, and they can be an absolutely exceptional pair of headphones. I love them for what they do because they're unique and they're very different from everything else. They stand apart and they have got their part to play in a lineup. And just check this freaking build quality. I mean, this is beautiful. Let's get on to the equipment that was used because <laughs> it's shocking. Um, I used the ore right there uh, with the Hypsos power supply and the Benchmark DAC3, which is a clinical DAC that's highly resolving. It's extremely well technically able, but fortunately we have the Hypsos power supply, which allows us ch to change voltage to the amplifier itself. We had the range of 26.9, V to about 22.5. I ran this through a thorough testing and I found the best voltage to be applied to that amplifier for these headphones was at 22.5 volts. It becomes smooth, detailed, highly resolving and a wonderful pairing. Absolutely fantastic. For example, the Sesvara voltage for that amplifier alone, you jump to 26.9. That's quite a swing. That gives credence to the voltage needed for these headphones is very specific. You can't apply too much power or too little power. It's got to be just right to make them sing. And on the TT2, the stage is broader. Image is better, timbre is nicer, it's more realistic because when the timbre is not good on these headphones, when you're using a system that is not well suited to these, it's shouty, it's sibilant, 
it's painful and uh, one of the most annoying experiences I've had with headphones. The A90, D90 being one of those, or the OR stack with a wrong voltage. If I do buy the TT2 and the M scaler, this will be one headphone that has to stay here because with this, it's absolutely mind-bogglingly good. Not for all the time, but for the times when I want the genres and that kind of detail and analytical listening that I've been discussing with you. Due to the fact that some of our data got lost, I have to finish the conclusion and the caveat section of the Fostex 909s. Some of the caveats for this headphone honestly are the following. The cable is a no-no. It feels like a vacuum cleaner cord. It's too thick and it's too heavy for such comfortable headphones. Even though those adapters cost a lot of money, I think it's worth replacing. Whether you wanna run this balanced or single-ended because they're so easy to drive is up to you, but I think a replacement of the cable is very much necessary. Another caveat is you're paying 2,400 freaking dollars for this. And the fact that something like the Atrium over there comes out in such a beautiful hard shell case with such beautiful design, and this comes away in a cardboard box that looks like a cereal box is rather annoying. Those are trivial. The most important thing of all is the synergy. You can't just plug this headphone into an amplifier and expect to get the best performance out of it. It really is a hunting game, a playing game. It really is one of them situations where you have to hunt for the right source. And that could be expensive, and irritating for a lot of viewers. But I'm telling you this now, if you do find the right source, it's a very unique headphone. It's a very unique sounding headphone. Its resolution is crazy. So let's give it some Tiger scores, shall we? Built, fit and finish. This is absolutely beautiful, comfortable and nice. Five Tigers. Accessories, presentation, two and a half tigers. I've seen much better. Synergy, ease of use, compatibility, two tigers. Comfortable, ergonomic, four tigers. This headphone deserves a very strong three tiger rating, legitimately. I like these headphones a lot. And if I keep the M scaler and the TT2 and buy my own, this will be added to the collection. Thanks for allowing me a couple of minutes of your time and allowing me to drop in from another review into this one to give you the summary of this headphone. And if you would like to see those reviews, like the Dave I just reviewed, etc., or like the signature behind me now, or like the May KTE behind me now, I am not even sure what headphones and what equipment was here when that review was done. Consider joining our Patreon, where early reviews will be thrown to you guys before anyone else, where you can come to the private Telegram chat and discuss all of these equipment as we're going through the review process and you get to chat to me on a one-to-one -one basis. If not, your like, subscribe and share is all I require from you. Consider joining the public Telegram chat. Jump in and say hi to everybody. And I will see you in the next one. Peace.